Toronto has been grappling with the idea of a downtown casino. Proponents say it will garner much needed revenue and jobs, while opponents warn of the high social costs. Should Toronto get into the casino business? Joining us now to help answer that, in Edmonton, Alberta, Brad Humphreys. He's chair in the economics of gaming at the University of Alberta. And we welcome into the studio Mike Layton, Toronto City Councillor in Ward 19, Trinity Spadina. Liz Pimentel, she is president of the Unite Here Local 75 Toronto Labour Union. And John Lawrence, journalist with Spacing Magazine. And it's good to have you three here in the studio. And Brad, nice to have you on the line from the province of Alberta. Let's Thanks go around on this. Okay, Liz, why do you want a casino in Toronto? Uh, I don't want a casino in Toronto without conditions. Uh, when we entered this debate at the very beginning, we said we would only support a casino, an integrated casino resort, if it involved union jobs and a fair share of revenue to the city that would allow for community benefits. And if they do those two things, if you're on side. If it does those two things, we're on side. If it doesn't, we're not. So if they create a casino and the benefits accrue to the city in terms of job creation, siting fees and all that, but the jobs are not unionized, you're not offside. Yeah, that's right. What, how, how would that be so different, that one proviso? Uh, well, we represent 8,000 hospitality workers in Toronto, and the difference between a good hospitality job and a bad hospitality job is really night and day. A union job uh, downtown, our lowest paid workers make $18 an hour and have full benefits. A person who doesn't have a union is making minimum wage. So. Uh, it really is the difference between getting by and not getting by, working one job or working multiple jobs to get by. And so there's a huge difference. And if this is going to be a major industry in our future, we need to make sure that these are good jobs. It's mostly women, immigrants, and people of color in these jobs. And so when they're bad jobs, it impacts women and immigrants and people of color disproportionately. Mike Layton, I have heard you make those very arguments numerous times over the years. Uh, maybe not related to a casino, but related to other things. How come not this time? Certainly. Well, first of all, when, when you look at the numbers, they, they're all over the place. They don't seem to add up. Uh, they, they're promising one number, and then it turns out it's, 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 it's yet a different one. Uh, and it seems to be just con consistently decreasing. Uh, so that's one of the reasons why there's, there's too much skepti to be skeptical about with the actual numbers, the job numbers, as well as the revenue that would come to the city. Uh, th then there's the elements, the impacts that a casino... Uh, will actually have on the city and one is uh, that the reports are that it'll take a billion dollars out of the local economy uh, transfer it from what people are doing with their entertainment dollars now uh, and and put it into gambling and into into a casino uh, that plus the 12 12 thousand parking spaces that are being called for uh, at, at exhibition place will paralyze the downtown core uh, the, the traffic in the downtown core causing further hardship to, to, to torontonians citywide uh, the, the final reason is, is the addiction element. And I started uh, researching up on this when it was first being rumored that there was going to be a casino at, uh, at, 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 exit, at, at Ontario Place. And I started looking into it a little bit. And really, if you think about what a casino is, it's, it's generating revenue for the province by taking money from a small group of individuals. And the more, you, but the more I read on it and the more I, I find researched on it, it's taking it from, from, from even more specific groups of vulnerable people and targeting them. Uh, because the games in a casino are unlike any other type of, of, of gambling. The, the, the highly addictive nature of the slot machines and the VLTs keep people at those machines. And you see this when you go to casinos. Every time we come on a talk show, you get calls from families that have grappled with this. Uh, and, and that's why what, what we heard from yesterday is 250 faith leaders in the city of Toronto that say, no, we have to pick up the pieces of the families. We see what happens. We don't think there should be a casino in the That city. was quite astonishing, actually. There, there, there isn't much in this world that unifies Jews, Christians, Muslims, who else was there? Uh, uh, Hindis, there was... Hindis, uh, Eastern Orthodox. Sikhs, there was yeah. Orthodox and... and they and all came Orthodox. together opposing casinos. And, and, and all for, for very similar reasons. Yeah. That some of them, it's not necessarily a purely religious reason, but it's more the service that they provide in communities. And for families, they see the impacts of casinos. Okay, let's go to Alberta. Brad, you're hearing some of the arguments here. Why don't you weigh in and tell us where you are on this? Um, well... Uh, so certainly problem gambling is an issue anytime you talk about casino gambling. And, uh, and everybody who does research in this area recognizes that uh, there are people who, uh, who ruin their lives and their families' lives and, and cause a great deal of pain through their uh, activities in casinos. But it, uh, there's also a lot of people who gamble responsibly and who derive a, a good deal of entertainment out of what they can do in a casino. 
Uh, and I think it's important you just have to balance off uh, uh, the two. I mean, problem gambling rates are relatively low among gamblers, among the people, you know, the fraction of people who would, who would really cause serious dam damage to their lives and their, and their families and, and friends. So, you know, I, I don't dispute that it's, it's not an important issue, but I think it's also important to remember that, that it is an entertainment activity. And, you know, the, the argument is correct that it's going to take money, entertainment spending, out of other activities in Toronto. I mean, that's basically a casino is going to move entertainment spending around from one part of the city to another, or uh, one time to another, uh, <coughs> because people are not going to draw down their life savings, well, except the problem gamblers, to, uh, to engage in some entertainment activity. Well, that's one of the points I've heard, Brad, is, is on the one hand, you don't want to make something illegal when 98% of the people or 97% of the people who are doing it are doing it fine, legally, and without tremendous adverse hardship, but doesn't the casino business really depend on that 3% uh, who will ruin their lives and spend every dollar they've got, and that's how they make a lot of their revenues. Isn't that the case? Uh, I don't think the evidence, I don't, I don't know of any, any uh, evidence that would say that really casinos can only operate off of problem gamblers. Not only operate, uh, but that's where they make their, I, I've been told anyway that that's where they make their big money. Um, I haven't, I've never read a, what I think would be a credible piece of research that would support the idea that the, that significant, that the, the majority of casino profits come from problem gamblers. Certainly some does, but I've, I've not seen uh, uh, evidence that, that suggests that a, a, the majority of it does. Okay. John Lawrence, why don't you come in here and tell us, as you've looked at this thing, whether you think Toronto, and I guess more particularly downtown Toronto, is the right place for a casino. My concern about the uh, about the casino debate at the moment is that the is that the proposed locations in the downtown, the CNE, the one at the Metro Convention Center, and the Portlands, which is not really in it, uh, are in the eastern end of the city. At the Portlands. eastern end of the city, are not really appropriate locations for for a facility of this size. This is where the big casino operators want to play. Um, the 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 development issues in building in these locations are huge. Um, there's going to be a lot of delay, a lot of like incredible amount of disruption associated with you know with this kind of redevelopment in an area of the city which is all, all already experiencing a tremendous amount of development pressure. And I think that that we, we seem to be having this conversation separating out the development pressure associated with um, you know a lot of the high-rise condominiums as well as you know this major new commercial hub um, and. Uh, you know, it overloads a uh, part of the city, which has got a lot of overloading problems already. My general point on casinos is that, I, I mean, we've opened the door on gambling a long time ago, a long time ago. Bingo. Yeah, 40 uh, years ago, lottery, lottery tickets, yeah. There's lots of slot machines around the GTA and in the area around the GTA. Um, so we've gone through that, uh, we've gone through that door. I think that the problem with the current debate is that it, the, the proposed locations, the desired locations are not appropriate. So just so I understand your position, you're okay with a casino as long as it's, let's say, up at the Woodbine racetrack where there's already that kind of activity happening, just not downtown. Yeah, I think that that's the, I think that that's my position. That's your position. Okay. I saw you leafing through that book there, uh, presumably looking for some follow-up well, information on something? I, I spent a little time in preparation for this, uh, this interview looking at, at, at the work done by the Alberta Research Institute. And I, what I saw uh, w worried me, um, in fact, because the, the best piece of research, unbiased research, that I could find was this U.S. international gambling report that was done by, uh, by, by or edited by a professor at the University of Illinois, uh, and then subsequently presented as under oath as, uh, to the U.S. House of Representatives. What's the book called? Um, the book's called, uh, it's the U.S. International Gambling Report. This is an abridged version uh, that's, that's, that's rather significant. Uh, but what it, what it clearly says is that there'll be uh, in, in e extreme uh, impacts from, from gambling uh, to the tune of about $3 uh, to, to every dollar that comes into the casino. It'll cost uh, our, our communities $3 in, in additional, uh, in additional in uh, services and, it, well, to... to, to uh, address the issues around uh, problem gambling, to address the issues with bankruptcy, uh, the additional services that will be required because of increased crime. That's what this uh, that's what this book references. And the reason why I find it concerning about what I'm hearing from from uh, the the Alberta Research uh, Gambling Research Institute is they quite prominently display uh, information and offer information from the America Gam American Gam Gaming Association, which is in fact funded by the gaming industry. This is where there's a problem. Who, the people who are funding the research can't be the ones to benefit from the use of it. Okay, Liz, let me bring you in at this point because 
I appreciate the I'm sure everybody appreciates the fact that you want good, high-paying jobs with benefits for, uh, <coughs> excuse me, for some of the people who, uh, at the moment, probably don't have jobs, and these jobs would be good jobs for them to have. Uh, the question is, at what cost? Mike has raised some issues saying the cost of doing good for your potential members is too high. You not see that? Well, I think it's the debate to have, you know, and That's why as, we're much, here, yeah, as, a, as much as it's been a, a somewhat painful debate, I think it's the right debate to have. Uh, if the costs outweigh the benefits, it shouldn't happen. If the benefits outweigh the costs, then it should. I'm, I'm not here to speak on behalf of the industry. I'm here to speak on behalf of working people who work in the service sector. Um, you know, and from our perspective, we think that if the jobs, if there are enough jobs and there are union jobs, and we know exactly what the difference is between a union job and a non-union job is, that is a significant benefit that needs to be weighed in all of this. But unions, at least as far as I know, have always had a, a social, the best ones have a social conscience as well. They don't just want any job with any benefit at any hourly rate. That's true. They want them <laughs> in the right fields where they can presumably do some good as well. It's true. Do you think this is consistent with that? I, I do. I mean, you know, sort of like what John Lawrence was just saying, we've already made the decision to have gaming in our community. We have 3,000 slot machines at the Woodbine Racetrack, which is in Toronto. Um, that's the biggest casino I've actually ever dealt with, and I've spent a fair bit of time around the, you know, gaming industry. Um, you know, so we, I think we've made that decision to have gaming in our communities. I think it does have some social costs, and they need to be addressed. But I think we also need to think about how many jobs and how many dollars it brings into our communities when we have union jobs in hospitality. If I could raise the issue of jobs for a second, and, and Woodbine in particular, uh, just earlier today, uh, uh, PSAC, the, the union representing the workers at, at Woodbine, released a press release that, saying that they, they're actually ready to go on strike, and partly because 55% of the workforce at Woodbine is part-time. It's, these aren't good jobs. If you look at the studies that are coming out of the U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics, uh, the, the number of jobs created by the gaming industry, including the service spin-off jobs, 70% of them pay under $11 an hour. Is that the type of good jobs that we want to be uh, risking and gambling with uh, when, when we talk about the city of Toronto, when you talk about the impact that the casino will have on, on other jobs around the city by sucking a billion dollars out of the local economy. Is this really the gamble we want to make for, for, for these types of jobs? And I agree, if we had a facility like this, we would, need, we would need to demand that they be good paying jobs so that the casino industry and the OLG, those that are going to walk away with fat pockets, leave something for the people working there and for the city. But all the evidence is pointing that they won't. Well, just one little follow up here. You say the OLG will walk away with fat pockets. I mean, the OLG is not some evil multinational. It is a, it is a provincial agency designed to fund hospitals and hockey arenas and all that kind of stuff. You'll acknowledge that. I'll, I'll acknowledge that, but, but they, they should be div getting their money and government revenue, uh, government revenue fairly. Take, get revenue to, to fund government services as it should be through fair method of, of, of yes, taxation. It's a dirty word. I know you <laughs> folks don't want us to say it, but, but that's how governments raise revenue to do good things. Brad Humphreys, what, what is the experience that you can bring to this in terms of telling us whether the jobs that get created a, are good, and B, last. Well, Steve, uh, actually, first, I'd just like to address a point that's been raised. The Alberta Gambling Research Institute is not funded by gambling money. That's funded by the province, and I'm an affiliated researcher there. And so it's factually incorrect to state that the Alberta Gambling Research Institute is funded by industry money. That's, I, I don't that's believe just I not made that correct. assertion, I, but you do feature the American Gaming Association prominently in your research links. I, I wasn't meaning to make, uh, to, to, to draw any other conclusion. Okay. So uh, much of the evidence you're talking about comes from the U.S. I've actually studied uh, employment and, and the sort of jobs that are created in casinos in Canada. And uh, certainly based on the research I've done in Alberta, uh, casino jobs are, are pretty good jobs. They are typically, uh, uh, most casino jobs, at least in Alberta, are full-time jobs. And they pay wages which are uh, higher on average than, than other jobs. So uh, I wouldn't say that based on our experience in Alberta that, that we're talking about having a lot of minimum wage part-time jobs created. Uh, most of them pay benefits and most of them are, are full-time positions. So uh, I don't know about the unionization issue. Is I, I don't know about that. I haven't really ever studied that. But I think that uh, if the casino in Toronto is going to be like casinos in Alberta, then you could expect uh, relatively 
good jobs to be created at, the, at that facility. Brad, if I may ask you a question, because I, I read your, your most recent paper on, on the jobs and, 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 and the differences between the U.S. and Canada uh, uh, situations, and you make some very valid points. Um, but one of the points you make is that the jobs are better in Canada because they're related, they're government jobs. The casinos are government run. Is that correct? Uh, well, that was one of the conclusions in, in the report, I thought. Uh, they're not, they're, well, they're regulated, um, but it's, it's generally, uh, well, we have a, a I, and I'm not certain about the details in, in Ontario, we have a charity gambling model, and so the casinos are, are run by private operators, and so the, the jobs there would not be government jobs. Uh, so I'm not, I'm not certain which of my papers you're referring to. Was it my report on, on uh, uh, the socioeconomic impact of gambling in Alberta? Um, I, I, it, it could have been. I, I read two recent reports. I can't remember the. I don't have them here. Well, but bottom line here is that the, the jobs in Toronto would be private sector jobs, they right? Would be. This would be a privately built casino, operated privately. Yes, regulated by the province of Ontario, but run essentially as a private company. And this is happening to the casinos and and, and the slots all all over Ontario right now. Is they're they're being privatized. And that's what some of the workers at existing facilities are worried about. That's something that I'm worried about. Well, let about. me find out from Brad. Is it, Brad, is that an issue? Are, are casinos that are sort of uh, operated and regulated by a government jurisdiction as opposed to by a private company uh, any better or any worse than any other? Um, I don't think we have much, uh, much evidence on that. Uh, at least I, my, my research hasn't, hasn't looked at how the, uh, the uh, ownership structure or the regulatory structure of, of the casino industry would affect the jobs, uh, the jobs created. But, I mean, certainly to the extent that we would just be talking about facilities that would be primarily slot machines or VOTs, that's, those jobs are, of course, not going to be uh, very high paying because there's really not any jobs associated with or very few associated with, uh, with uh, slot machine gambling. But casinos that have table games, those tend to be skilled employees that, that uh, work in those environments. So in that sense, it doesn't really matter uh, if it's government owned and operated or if it's a, if it's privately owned and operated in terms of uh, uh, what the jobs are like because you know a casino job is a is a casino job if it's a if it's a table game uh, uh, employee okay let me get John Lawrence on this. John well I think a lot depends also on which uh, gaming company wins this contract because there's one of the big gaming companies Las Vegas Sands which is very aggressively anti-union so it doesn't like unions in its in its casinos the other thing about this issue is that there is a sort of a zero net sum uh, quality to this debate because the jobs that will be created here are jobs that will probably be lost in the other gaming and casino facilities and the slot facilities elsewhere in Ontario. Ontario Lottery and Gaming Corporation says that a lot of uh, gaming money actually leaves the GTA for um, you know Niagara and Casino Rama and some of the other um, casino facilities in southern Ontario. So they're trying to get that money back. And so what is the impact on those casinos and those slot facilities in, you know, <coughs> elsewhere in southern Ontario. So I think that, you know, where we may be raising the employment numbers here, we're going to be dropping them in other communities where perhaps the employment uh, picture is a little bit more challenging than it is in Toronto. So I'm not... For so are we going through all this and at the end of the day it's just going to be a wash? Well, that's what Ontario Lottery and Gaming says. I mean, they, they mostly what they want to do is they want to, they want to recapture the, um, the gaming money that's leaving the GTA. And this also raises another question about the whole uh, notion of building a big integrated resort and casino complex and, you know, with convention center and so on. I mean, you know, are the people who are going to come and sit at the slots and play at the gaming tables, are they going to be from the GTA or are they going to be tourists or, you know, people visiting from elsewhere in Canada or the United States. Presumably uh, both, wouldn't they be? Well, uh, but th this is the, the market studies that OLG has done suggests otherwise. So, so there seems to be sort well, of a... They, where, where, where are all the players going to be from? Well, they say that a lot of, them, a lot of the money is going to come from the GTA. And so why are we building this big um, integrated resort? Why is that the vision? The Ernst & Young report that was presented to, to the city said that 65% of it would be from the GTA. Local Existing money. money spent in the GTA would be going into the casino. And there are big casino operators that have suffered from serious, um, uh, you know, problems with vacancy rates in the in the hotels. Um, you know, with with a, a lack of attendance. There's a two and a half billion dollar casino in Atlantic City that's um, on the verge of bankruptcy now because they just can't get the numbers through the door. Let me get Brad on this. Brad, what is the experience in other jurisdictions where? 
if you build a brand new shiny casino in a city, is any other casino within, say, two or two and a half hours drive of that casino going to see a corresponding loss in gaming? Yes, absolutely. Jurisdictional competition is, is uh, tremendously important, and certainly the research backs up all the, uh, <coughs> everything that everybody said here uh, in the last few minutes. It's, it's uh, uh, a very serious problem, and, and uh, it goes on in the U.S., it goes on in, in Canada, uh, it, it goes on all over the world where there's jurisdiction, jurisdictional uh, competition for gambling dollars, and it is, it, it is an entertainment activity, and so the newest, shiniest, nicest facility is going to draw more gamblers to it than, than older and, and uh, less new and shiny facilities. So, and I, I, I think the study is probably exactly right that much of the money that's spent in a new uh, casino in Toronto is going to be money that would have been spent in the GTA somewhere else. So Liz, let me ask the follow-up. If you get, eight, what did you say, 8,000 new jobs, new high-paying, good benefit casino jobs in downtown Toronto, but if they come at the expense of people who live in Aurelia, or people who live in Niagara Falls, or people who live in Windsor, what's the point? I'm no expert on the other jurisdictions. I don't but think you have to be an expert <laughs> to answer that question, though. I, you know, I mean, I read about this a lot as well, just like everybody else here. And I guess my, my feeling is that it seems like there's a supply and demand thing, and customer tastes are changing. And there's some logic to building where the customers are. You know, so if the union a, arguing supply and demand, really? I, I normally wouldn't. I mean, no trust kidding. me, I'm not the not the biggest fan of capitalism on this panel. <laughs> but uh, you know, I, there there are changing tastes, and I, I think mostly about what this could do in Toronto and what we could do with these jobs. And I know that if it was a good operator and it was here, we would see some benefits here. Whereas now there is gaming, you know, all around Ontario and in and around the GTA, we don't see very much benefit. Let from me it. do a follow up here. If if this were a casino, and it won't be, but if it were a casino that were owned and operated and regulated by Ontario Lottery and Gaming, in other words, the jobs are here, the revenue stays here, the management is here, it's all here, that would be one thing. Do you have any issue with the fact that it will be, almost 100% for sure, an American outfit that runs this thing, presumably some of the take is going to go back to Las Vegas, yes, some of the money will stay here, the jobs will be here, but some of the take is going back to Vegas. You got any issues with that? I have a lot of issues with that. <laughs> and you're still supporting this anyway. Well, well, no. I mean, I want to explain. We represent 100,000 gaming workers across North America and in all of these jurisdictions you're talking about. So Las Vegas, Atlantic City, uh, you know, you name it, we're there. And so, um, so I know these companies well. And I know that some of them are going to be good operators to work for and create the kind of jobs that I'm talking about. And some of them won't. Who's and good so, who's bad? I really can't say. I'll get myself in some trouble. <laughs> These companies have a lot of money. I'll let, I'll let uh, John, you know, uh, mention one. But, um, you know, we have to be really, really careful about what kind of operation we let into this place, which is why we've been saying to the city councillors, you know, you really should put some, put some conditions on this. We need to make sure that whatever operator comes here is one that's going to respect people's right to unionize because the less regulated some, I mean, I'm, I'm in favor of regulation. Uh, but the less regulated the situation is, the more you need unions because we really are the check and balance to make sure that these are good jobs. Let me ask Mike about hosting fees because one of the, one of the big pluses for this, for Toronto, was supposed to be the notion that Toronto would get a bigger, special hosting fee because this casino was theoretically going to be a cash cow unlike any other in the province. And then Premier Wynne came in and said, uh-uh, you're going to get the same deal everybody else does, period, full stop. What's the issue around that for you? I, since day one, I had been saying that it's ludicrous to think that Toronto would get a special deal out of, out of the equation, at least with relation to how much of the revenue, because that's not the way provincial politics works in, 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 in Ontario. Even when the Premier's from Toronto? Even when the Premier's from Toronto, they need to give all the communities across Ontario a fair shake in it. And if you're going to host a casino, you're, you're, you're dealing with some of the same issues, and you're going to have some of the same uh, impacts that you're going to have to address. So it's it's that we're not going to get a special deal. So let's look at the deal that we're getting. Until the renegotiation over the past year or so, Windsor and Niagara Falls were getting in the order of $3 million a year to host their casinos. A pittance. 
a, 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 a minor fraction, less than 5%. The number that they're more, it's more likely to be is closer to about 5%. That's the direction they're going. It's a percentage 5 system. 5% of the revenue of the generated? Of the revenue generated from, from the gambling. And it's, it's, it, it, it moves around because it, it increases as the facility gets larger um, or the percentages increase. So you're looking in the order of, 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 of 200, or $20 million uh, to, to be the higher end of, of, of Toronto's tax. $20 million. $20 million a On year. a budget of $12 billion? Which is, it's, it's a fraction. It, this isn't going to build the subways that the mayor's promising. It's, it, that's insane to, to, even, to, to even suggest that. It's irresponsible to say that it's going to be $200 million, and that's what, what continues to come out of some politicians' mouths, which is ridiculous to think. John, let me get you on this. Do you think Toronto is entitled to a better deal than any other city because this casino will generate more money than any other city? It, it doesn't make sense to me. I mean, I think that, I think that, that you know, um, I mean, it doesn't make sense politically that you know, there, are, there are a lot of communities that you know, depend on the jobs and so on and depend on the revenue. Um, so it doesn't make sense politically. And I think that the, you know, I mean, I agree with Councillor Layton. There, there are impacts on the city and um, you know, it's, the, the city has to do something to, to address those impacts. And specifically, there's gonna be a lot of development related impacts if it's gonna be in the downtown area. There's gonna right. be traffic and parking and all of that stuff, so. Okay, let's actually get another experience from somebody who's been through all this. And we are joined now on the line from Philadelphia, Pennsylvania by Suzette Parmley who's a gaming writer with the Philadelphia Inquirer newspaper. And Suzette, I'm glad you could join us today because your city, Philadelphia, has been through some of what we are debating for Toronto right now. And I just wonder if you could uh, just take a moment and tell us what the experience in Philly was like and what we may learn from your experience. Sure, thank you for having me. Um, absolutely, Philadelphia went through some of the same issues and debates about having not just one casino, but two casinos. Uh, we got our two licenses awarded to us from the Pennsylvania Gaming Control Board in December of 2006. It took four years for the first one to get built. Believe it or not, because of strong community opposition, political opposition, and then you had the recession in between that killed the lending markets. So our first casino didn't open until 2010, and it was that same year that the second license was revoked for all the delays over four years. And it wasn't until this last summer that the gaming board decided to put the uh, license again out for competition. There are currently six applicants right now in Philadelphia all vying for the opportunity to build that second casino in the city. Okay, so that, tell me this, were, right. the, were the jobs unionized at the casino that's in place now? No, they are not unionized. They're not unionized jobs. So Liz, you're not, no. Liz is not in favor, we know that. Uh, how about the <laughs> siting fee? How much money did the casino pay the city of Philadelphia in order to do business there? Believe it or not, there was no fee for the site itself. They had to pay to get their slot machine license and their table game license, which was in the tune of about $150 million for both of them. Well, that's a good chunk of change, but you're saying on top of that, there's, no, there's no annual sort of piece of the revenue, piece of the action that Philadelphia gets for having sited the casinos in the city. Well, there is a portion of it that, of that 55% tax of every dollar you gamble in Pennsylvania goes to the state. And of that 55%, uh, less than 5% goes back to all the host cities. There are currently 11 host cities throughout the state of Pennsylvania. Philadelphia is one of them. Okay. So we get a percentage of the take. Okay. Next question is this. Obviously, people who were opposed to the casino, which you say came in in 2010, uh, listed things like increased crime, cost to the city of security, increased alcoholism, increased other social ills, problem gaming, and so on. How much of any of that, admittedly only two years into this project, two and a half years, how much of that has happened? Believe it or not, it's been minimal. Uh, I've been covering this consistently, the industry, for six years. And those issues, at the extent that the activists and those against casinos argued to death that they were going to bring all this you know, corruption, prostitution, crime, you look at the crime stats in Philadelphia, that has not materialized. It's been a very small percentage, maybe a few incidences a year, vandalism, theft, but no, nowhere to the extent of what they were arguing when they were saying we don't need casinos in the city of Philadelphia. Okay, and one more question, Suzette, on this, and that is one of the arguments that we're hearing here is, if you build it here, you will simply take business away from other casinos that are close to here. We know that Philadelphia is not that far away from Atlantic City, New Jersey, and I'm wondering what the impact on 
those casinos there has been because Philadelphia built its casino where it did. Terrific question. Uh, we not only have one casino in Philadelphia, within a 20 mile radius in the suburbs of Philadelphia, we have three other casinos. So that's four casinos in the Philadelphia area competing head to head with 12 casinos in Atlantic City. And those 12 casinos in Atlantic City have been battered in terms of their revenue over the last six years since Pennsylvania opened its doors to casinos. I'll give you some pretty grim statistics. Atlantic City has lost $2.2 billion in gaming revenue since 2006, the same year Pennsylvania opened its first casino. It's lost about 9,000 casino jobs. Guess what? Pennsylvania has gained 16,400 casino jobs in six years. And its gross gaming revenue right now just topped $3.2 billion, making Pennsylvania the second largest gaming market in the United States after Las Vegas. It toppled Atlantic City this year for the first time. With its, its four casinos do more business than the 12 or 13 in Atlantic City? Collectively, the state of Pennsylvania oh, has all of Pennsylvania. done better I than Atlantic City. Because Atlantic City has them all on a one-mile strip. Right. We have them statewide in, um, in Pennsylvania, which just really quickly draws to that point while, why those who want a casino in Toronto are arguing for one is because in Pennsylvania, they put our casinos in very dense population centers where people, a lot of people are in the congregation of a casino. Atlantic City, they built them away from the population center. You have to drive there like 50 or 60 miles, which no longer appeals to gamblers because they would rather be gambling than driving to a casino. That's the, the big argument, why you need them closer and you would generate more revenue. And it's the same argument OLG is making for Toronto in some of the research I did on this topic. So it's on exactly balance, argument. on balance, has it worked? For Pennsylvania, absolutely. But all of Pennsylvania's gain has come to the pain and loss of Atlantic City. So those who don't like casinos to begin with say, look, it's a zero-sum gain. You, you basically redistributed the casino jobs. You <coughs> redistributed the gambling dollars. You didn't create anything new. You just moved these jobs and revenue around from one state to, other, to the other. And those in Pennsylvania say, say, yeah, it's been great. You know, you lowered our property taxes. You've given a lot to these host communities that wouldn't have had this additional gaming revenue to work with, to do projects and economic development. And you created over 16,000 jobs in Pennsylvania in six years during what has probably been one of the worst recessions. And not very many industries can boast that here. So it's, it's there are pluses and minuses to both sides. Okay, Suzette, thank you for that report from south of the border. That gives us more to think about here. Brad, let me start with you. Is there anything Suzette just said that makes you reconsider any position that you may have had on this? Oh, no. This is, uh, this is certainly not new information to me. I think the one thing I would add to uh, Suzette's comments is um, certainly there is this jurisdictional competition for gambling dollars, but uh, as, as we've already pointed out, gambling is already available in many forms, and so the other factor here is that online gambling is becoming more popular. Online poker and, you know, online casino games, table games, slot machines, I don't know why people play this, but they do. And uh, that money is, is going out of, the, out of the community completely because those online casinos are operated offshore somewhere or some server farm or something like that. So when you open a bricks and mortar casino in a city like the GTA or an area like the GTA, uh, it is possible that there will be some money spent there which would have alternatively been spent online which would really have gone out of the community. Hmm. So it is possible that, that uh, it's not a completely zero sum game. Well, it's certainly zero sum across uh, you know, a, a, the country of Canada or you know, in the United States across the country, but it's possible that there will be some other spending which, is, which could be kept uh, and, and actually go to people that are employees and have jobs and not just uh, somebody operating a server somewhere. Okay, let me put that to Mike Layton. Mike, you've heard from the Philadelphia experience that yes, uh, Philadelphia has done very well, admittedly at the expense of some other neighboring casinos, but Philadelphia has done well. You're a Toronto City Councilor. Is it your obligation to look out for Toronto and say, never mind what's going on in Aurelia or Windsor or Niagara Falls, Toronto will see more revenue, therefore we should have this. Well again, I'm gonna, I, I'm gonna stand by, I don't think we're gonna see much more revenue. I think we might see a little bit in a hosting fee, maybe there'll be, be a little bit in, in, in property taxes, but the negatives will, f will far outweigh the, the positives. Um, I, I appreciate that, that, that perhaps some of the negative effects haven't been felt quite yet in, in, in Philadelphia, but based on the literature and, and the research that I've reviewed, uh, the, the overwhelming 
amount of research from the, from the U.S. International Gambling Report that says this will have severe impacts. I, I'm going to turn to our, the Toronto Medical Officer of Health for advice. Ask him, and what he says is the number of problem gamblers in the city will double to 20,000. He was in that chair not too long ago telling us the same thing. And, 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 this, and this is the research, and that's the advice that I think we should bring to City Hall to make up our final, uh, our final conclusion. John, anything from Pennsylvania make you change your mind about your thoughts on this? Well, I think that, it, I think that potentially the city is exposing itself to a risk by, by allowing the development of something very large, a big physical um, entity in, in the city that could become vulnerable to competition from a jur uh, neighboring jurisdiction. New York State is under a lot of pressure to build casinos in upstate New York, as a for instance. Um, so what happens if we build something and then um, we see the phenomenon that happened between Atlantic City and Pennsylvania. Well, Buffalo built one two years later and back to square one. <laughs> and and so, so, so then you have a white elephant. You have this big thing that you don't have any other use for. And I think that that's a big consideration, especially if we're looking at very valuable downtown land. Liz, you got a comment on anything you've heard out of Pennsylvania and how that might affect us here? Uh, well, just on the social impact question that keeps on coming up, I, I feel like we need to weigh this against the social impact of high unemployment rates, underemployment, people working multiple jobs to get by, and, and that's what I feel like keeps getting lost in this whole discussion. In Toronto, there are a lot of people who do not have jobs or who are working in minimum wage jobs and multiple jobs and are not able to be at home with their kids in the evenings and there are people who I, I know very well are members who have worked their tails off to get their kids if, through if university. I don't mean to interrupt but if they work in a casino they're going to be working a lot of evenings and a lot of overnights too I'm guessing yes? <laughs> it depends what shift you work. Well, <laughs> Some of our hotel workers work nights yeah, too yeah. but um, you know there are a lot of people who have worked really hard to get their kids through school and they're now graduating with no jobs and we've got a really really high youth unemployment rate here so we do need to think hard about whether we can turn our nose up at five, ten thousand jobs that are, you know, if they're union, that they would be very, very good okay. jobs. Okay, 20 so. seconds left here, Mike Layton, tell me this. There are 45 members of Toronto City Council. Ultimately, they will decide. Where are the votes today, as far as you can tell? Well, I actually think it's the people of Toronto that are going to decide. We're hearing more and more from, from our residents and councillors across uh, the city. And uh, we're, getting, we're getting petitions from, from nocasinotoronto.com. We're, we're, we're hearing from our religious leaders. We're hearing from businesses okay, But you vote workers. at the end of the day. We what, vote at the end of the, the day. What's the vote going to be? Um, I, I think uh, the, the, the movement is pushing towards a no. Pushing towards a no? To, uh, towards a no, uh, no casino people. When they're looking at the facts, when they're hearing from the residents, uh, that's what I'm hearing from my colleagues. And the vote will be when? We don't know yet. Uh, the, the report hasn't been complete. Uh, the, the final report hasn't been completed yet, uh, and we're still waiting. Okay. Suzette Parmley, we're glad you could join us on the line from Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Look forward to reading more of your good work in the Philadelphia Inquirer. Brad Humphreys, the chair of the Economics of Gaming at the University of Alberta, thank you for being there on the line from Edmonton. And here in the studio, Mike Layton, the Toronto City Councillor, Liz Pimentel, the President, Local 75, Toronto, Unite Here, and John Lawrence from Spacing Magazine, whose stuff we always enjoy reading. Nice to have you all here. Support Ontario's public television. Donate at tvo.org.